Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. George Taylor. I'm happy to be here with you. Um, the reason why I'm making this video because some of you want to see my face and say, hey, we'd love to meet you, uh, especially the purely online students. Uh, so you know, I have been teaching for quite some time, and I'm just going to share a couple of words about myself. Let me move this over to the side. Look kind of small. There we go. And also what qualifies me to teach you organizational behavior and theory. So before I was a professor, um, I served a career in the Navy. That career was 24 years long, believe it or not. And that's when I got my taste of human resources. I came in as a yeoman. And a yeoman is essentially uh, someone that takes care of personnel transactions. I didn't have that job coming in, coming in. And so one of my mentors came up to me and said, hey, you know, you would be great because you love people. And I've been loving people forever, as long as I can remember. Was As I advanced in the Navy, um, I was also very driven. And I'm still driven to this day. And someone recognized that drive and said, you know what? You would be great if you were to become a human resource officer. We call it limited duty officer. But what I did was essentially uh, manpower. I did staffing. Um, and I became a department head. And I twice served as a department head. And both times, I smashed it. I killed it. And so some of you already know that I oversee entrepreneurship. But I'm also very much qualified to teach you human resources. Uh, some of my achievements include I've uh, been certified in human resources to include a senior certified partner that's given by SHRM, some people call it SHRM, Society of Human Resource Management. Uh, I'm also a senior professional in human resources, and that's awarded by the senior uh, professional human resources, uh, by Human Resource Certification Institute. And last but not least, I'm a certified professional coach. So all of that together uh, gives me considerable expertise. I've written articles on uh, human resources, organizational behavior, entrepreneurship, knowledge sharing, uh, and got more to come. But I'm also always sharpening my saw. So currently, I am going for my second doctorate. And my second doctorate is in education leadership, and I love it. I love everything about it. Uh, so let's have some fun. You know, let's just say enough talking. Let's do some walking. So real quickly, I just want to have a conversation with you. Uh, well, real conversation requires two people, but share with you the history of organizational behavior and what you can expect in this course. Uh, and why it's important for you to know about organizational behavior as workforce practitioners talk a little bit about the Mars model, and that's fairly new, and uh, individual behaviors and how they spill over. Now, OB is really a fairly new construct, and fairly new meaning that it's probably a little bit over 100 years old, but not much more than that. Uh, and it came about because when we went into the era of mass production and we entered the Industrial Revolution of the early 20th century, we knew starting off we needed to produce many parts and that time was important and efficiency was important. But we also knew that as organizations, staff, people, the people have to interact with each other. So the first phase of uh, organizational behavior, at least from a historic perspective, is acknowledging the scientific management period. The scientific management period was driven by this guy named Frederick Taylor. And also we had uh, Larry Gilbert and his wife uh, kind of say, you know what? Time is important. Motion is important because that gives us efficiency. There's also make sure that how we make part A is how we're going to make part B. But if we advance in the organization and people started interacting with each other, uh, we knew that we had to get everybody on the same sheet of music, that we had to advance effort, you know, where everyone is in lockstep. And that's really where 
modern organizational behavior theory came in. And to me, the historical point that's often in textbooks that really ushered in organizational behavior is the Hawthorne experiment. And some of you know about that because that's when um, Elton Mayo and his colleagues went to the Hawthorne plant and they had this experiment that said, you know what, we want to see how we can increase the productivity of people uh, so that you, management, can get the most out of your need from your people so that you can deliver on your expectations. So what happened is, you know, Elton and his colleagues, Elton Mayo and his colleagues went into these rooms that conducted these series of experiments on productivity. That, you know, that was the, pretty much the genesis of it. But what happened was they found out when they started adjusting lighting and they started um, making it known they were observing people, then, you know, management said, you know what, we're on to something here. Because when people know that they're being watched, when people feel like they have some form of interaction, then they adjust their behaviors to match that interaction appropriately, right? And so when you build good culture uh, and you have effective managers and these uh, managers interact with employees and employees interact with employees and employees interact with managers and so on and so forth, then what happens is productivity increases even more and you're able to keep uh, people at the organization. You're able to achieve uh, great things because everyone feels like they're a part of something special. I mean, think about school, for example. You're not being educated for the most part on how to create an organization, even though we need more of that, and that's why I love entrepreneurship. What you're being taught in school is how do you fit into the workforce and by extension, how do you fit into organization so you can enter into a career that's meaningful to you? That makes sense? So, you know, as brash and harsh as it may sound, we're being trained and developed to be good employees, right? And to contribute our talents to the organization so the organization can be great. Now, that's a great thing because most people are going to uh, be members of an organization. Most people are not starting these organizations. And work is meaningful. Work gives you esteem. Work gives you prestige. Positions give you power. And all that's good and all that's important to living a meaningful life. Uh, so kind of getting into the content of this slide right here, what it's saying is that, you know, organizational behavior is wide and it's deep and it covers so many things. We're talking about culture. We're talking about job satisfaction. We're talking about leadership. Uh, we're talking about team dynamics and stress. Uh, and we have these periods to kind of reset what it is that we're trying to learn about organizational behavior. So the most recent one that was major was, of course, uh, COVID, which was the great pandemic. And so this slide right here tells you what I already said just from my heart, right? OB is concentrated on how people think, feel, and what they do when they're around others because we work in groups, and these groups are highly interdependent. And so as employees, it's very important for you to know about organizational behavior because the more you are knowledgeable about interactions with other people, the more you can understand the environment, both the external environment and the internal environment, and the more you understand about the importance of perception and how you manage perception, how you manage behaviors and expectations, the more effective leader that you can be. Um, and so OB feeds into these processes within the organization. Number one, it feeds into strategy, right? We know that because the organization is an open system that interacts with the external environment, right? So SMSU is an example, is an organization. Well, SMSU is interacting with other universities, the competition, it's interacting with business leaders and industry leaders so they can tell us, like, this is what we want your graduates and your students to know. It's interacting 
um, with certification and professional associations. This is how you can uh, teach your students standards and uh, ethics that's going to make them even more productive and feel like they're more part of your organization. And most importantly, is interacting with customer and clients, right? Because they are major stakeholders that allow the organization to advance along this life cycle. And we also focus on organizational behavior because as we interact within the organization, we need to make sure that we can transform raw materials and take the human capital to produce outputs. And then to that last point, we know that we are satisfying their needs and collaborating with multiple groups of stakeholders. Who are those stakeholders? There are your customers, clients, there are your employees, they are the managers, they are the executives, and they are the communities in which they are serving and members of. And so this goes back to that notion of the open systems approach, right? And you can tell I said everything just on the slide already. No, we're taking raw materials, human resources, information, financial resources, and equipment, and we're getting feedback from all these systems and subsystems within the environment. Uh, and then we are producing services and products, and we are creating value for shareholders. We gain the support of the community in which our organizations are located, and we're addressing uh, environmental needs that are important to these communities so we can be good stewards, right? All that's important. And so one thing that you probably know at this point in your studies is that your true source of competitive advantage is in your people. Your processes can be duplicated. Your um, uh, uh, resources can be acquired. And pretty much the only way that you're going to get to sustain competitive advantage is through your people. Your people are going to feel like they are something special. They're going to in turn survival again because when you got survival, you got success. And when we lead and we direct these people, we are assessing their behaviors in times of change and being in unfamiliar situations, and we are adjusting and addressing these issues, then we give ourselves a chance to survive. And so investing in employees is probably one of the best investments a company can make. And this one I already talked about, and that is that both internal and external stakeholders look to have their needs addressed through the organization, right? And at times, stakeholders may have competing interests, and not all stakeholders are, well, I say, should say, uh, are created equal at all times, right? Sometimes the customer can be the most important because if the customers are not happy, then uh, the stakeholders, especially the shareholders, can get the desired returns. Sometimes, depending on the situation, the shareholders may be uh, at the top of the list because without their capital, we're not going to even have the financial resources to push our company forward. Sometimes the uh, employees are at the top of the pyramid because without happy and productive employees ready and motivated to perform the work, then we don't get finished products and services. But sometimes the managers are at the top of the pyramid because we don't have people to coordinate actions uh, and lead, then we can't get done what we need to get done. Uh, and then what the second half of this slide is saying is beyond just profit, the organization has an obligation to its communities, to uh, employees, to uh, all these different areas, and one notion of that is called corporate social responsibility. The corporate social responsibility in this context is saying, what is the organization doing above and beyond profit? So one thing they can do is like, you know, what are we doing economically to support um, a better world for tomorrow? And we're looking at how we can increase the quality of life uh, of our employees and of our managers and enriching the uh, shareholders so that they continue to give. We're also talking about sustainability 
uh, through society and the environment. So how we are, how are we as organizational leaders and employees reducing the harmful impact that we put uh, on uh, in areas of waste and well, how are we addressing uh, needs like hunger? How we how are we communicating with uh, internal stakeholders to make sure that what's important to them is also important to us. And so this slide is saying that OB is integrative in nature. There are so many things that go into uh, an OB model. So starting at the top, you know, we already talked about this. We have the structure, culture, technology. Organizations are always changing. We got human resource practices because we got to lead, motivate, and retain the workforce. We have the organizational strategy. But then you have individuals, you have groups, and these two interact with each other, right? So when it comes to the individual, we got to look at how people are driving themselves. We got to look at what are some of the intrinsic motivators as well as the extrinsic motivators to get people uh, excited about their work. And then what are some emotions and attitudes, right? Like what's your short-term feeling? How do your short-term feelings, your emotions, impact your, impact your attitudes towards your work and toward the organization? And then we have basic personality traits and behaviors that are inherent in us, but we also have some things that we can influence and adjust. Uh, and then through this, individual consideration, we get this team dynamic, right? So starting from the top, you know, teams have tasks and they have charters. Uh, and when you interact with other people, you got to build up an element of trust and you got to have great communication, ideally. Uh, and then you got to, you know, break up tasks and you got to deal with the influence of teams. You got to deal with the politics of team and all that's so important. And then it drills down even further into outcomes. And so at the individual level, you have these expectations on your behavior, and then you have the needed adjustments that you're gonna to need to make as employees or managers so that you can stay a part of the organization. The organizational citizenship is essentially like, what are those discretionary behaviors and actions that we take because we're so proud to be part of our organizations, right? It's, we're so proud that we wear the T-shirts. We're so proud that we go out in the community. We're so proud that we may even go above and beyond in our jobs. And it's important to have space for these discretionary efforts because when we do, employees are really engaged and feel good about their work. And then, of course, that interacts with the team dynamic. When you get team performance, teams are open, honest, and transparent. They're talking. Uh, you have increased collaboration. And then you have these social networks. At the end of the day, all of this gives you uh, the outcomes of the organization, right? So you want an open system fit. And so in plain English, the organization has to be in a position where it can take in information from the external environment. It can process that information. It can make the needed adjustments within the environment and then uh, produce the output and deliver the services that are expected, uh, but also being a good steward. So that's where that corporate social responsibility comes in. And so there are some things that anchor or organizational behavior. One is, you know, we just don't make this stuff up. Organizational behavior is evidence-based, right? And what that means is that it's driven by uh, anthropology and sociology, but most of all, uh, uh, psycho uh, uh, psychology, right? And uh, we collect data and information on people. We collect information on groups. We collect data and information on artifacts and history. And we study events, and these events lead to evidence, and this evidence is later implemented into the organization in the form of initiatives, projects and programs and that's very important to know and this is what i already talked to so i've been talking about ob for so many years but it's multidisciplinary in nature and that's important to know because we're looking at multiple fields uh and it also has this contingency anchor in which because the organization interacted with so many so much stimuli so to speak it has to find out which stimuli to respond to 
And then he has to develop a way to come up with interventions that are important to addressing the stimuli so that the organization can advance along this life cycle. And then we have these multiple levels within the organization itself to include the individual, to include the team, um, so that we can deliver on our goals and objectives that make up our strategy. And so as the organization has advanced, it has become more diverse and not just nationally, but internationally. And so part of the new era of organizational behavior is thinking about how does the organization interact with diverse groups, uh, number one. And then number two is uh, what defines diversity? Now, in the early days, the driving factor of diversity was our demographic consideration. So that's race, obviously, gender, uh, national origin, color. All those were the early things that the organization looked at, and those were the initial points that, uh, the initial dimensions that the organization had to address. But then as time advanced on, then diversity became this deeper construct. We started looking across generations. Then we start looking at things like behaviors. We start looking at things like beliefs. We start looking at things like values and attitudes. And so the demographic piece and the uh, physiological piece is the surface level, but then at the deep level are our behaviors and our beliefs and our value systems. But they also is diversity among different generations, as we know. Uh, and so. Some of the things about addressing diversity is it gives us a more inclusive workplace. And when people feel like they belong, then they can be more creative. Uh, they feel like they have a voice and they feel like they're being represented. They feel like the standards of ethics or there's an ethical framework in which everyone can uh, be expected to act as individuals and groups, but also do it following some rules of the road where everyone's not going their own separate ways, uh, creating unsafe working environments or creating so much chaos that the mission of the organization doesn't get done. Uh, now, there are some drawbacks to diversity, as you see at the bottom of the slide. And some of those drawbacks include that too much diversity or diversity unmanaged can lead to too much unsettling or trying to figure the other person out that can make the organization uh, less efficient. and or it can, it can create more conflict in the workplace. Now, another area that's becoming increasingly important within organizational behavior is how we're accounting for this 24 seven world that we live in. It seems like no matter where we go, uh, even when we're not at work, we feel like we should be at work, right? And so that's a problem, right? We need to address that. But we also need to realize that people need time to recharge, that people need time to uh, live meaningful lives outside of work. And millennials, thank you, because uh, you are the ones that kind of brought this era forward and to go even further to generation beliefs, generation X, uh, generation Y and Z really, really believe in work-life balance, and that's changing the organization. Um, also, when you're in the organization, you have multiple roles to fulfill, and so we need to account for that. Uh, and we also have people that look for different things from the organization. Some people want to work from home now. Some people want to be a part of the organization. Some people want to work uh, in one job and go to another job. And so we have these ways in which we can address that, and one is like flexible work scheduling or making sure that we look at the knowledge, skills, and ability required for the job, but we also look at the whole person so that we know what drives that person beyond that job because that's going to be important to making sure that we can uh, motivate them and retain them as time moves on. This one I just talked to, so remote work is a real thing. Now, uh, a lot of leaders in the organization are pushing back and say, you know what, the only way that you can build culture is by being at a site, a traditional site. Uh, but there are other leaders that say, you know what, culture is um, a construct that can be built away from a physical location. But what you need to know as practitioners and leaders is that there is more than one way to skin a cat. 
and depending on the culture and the context of the operations that are being under that are being pursued by the organization, it depends, right? In some cases, remote work may be appropriate. You know, I can hear it sometimes with State Farm. I can hear it uh, with eBay, but there are sometimes where uh, the traditional approach being in a building is important. So that we have the Mark Zuckerbergs and the Elon Musk say, you know what? Remote work might work for some people, but we are better served by having uh, brick and mortar builders and, ha and having a physical site. Uh, and so this is just more on remote work and why it's important that remote work can take on more than one flavor. You can have hybrid work where you do some work at home, then some work at the company premises. Uh, and then you can have these organizations that don't really have one location, but uh, depending on what they do, the nature of the task, the work can take place across different areas, nationally or internationally for that matter. And, you know, of course, there are benefits and drawbacks to remote work. Me as a leader and being an entrepreneur myself, I think one of the things I found challenging is that it's hard to build culture in my case, in my instance, in the absence of something to rally behind, right? Uh, so that's just my little piece of it. Uh, and then you have these remote work contingencies, right? So remote work can be uh, low tax interdependence. You don't really need a lot of people to do the work. Uh, I can do what I do at the comfort of my home as a remote worker, and I can transfer my work very readily. Like uh, I work um, at another college. I, you know, I teach a couple of classes here and there, and they are completely online, but they have a strong culture as well. They have a culture of excellence, just like here at Southwest Minnesota State University, we have a culture of excellence. Uh, and um, we can also look at the characteristics of remote work and find out how we can maintain uh, this notion of teamwork that's important. So now we get to a pretty recent model here, and we call this model uh, the Mars model. And the reason why we call it the Mars model is because we're looking at uh, motivation, uh, ability, and role perception, as well as situational factors. So you can see here that our personalities, our values, our self-concept, how we feel about ourselves, along as, as well as our perceptions, how we perceive events and things that we can't control, uh, our emotions and attitudes and how we deal with stress, it's going to impact our motivation, ability, and our perception of our jobs and our perception of the organization. Then you have these situational factors that's going on in the external environment, and then that's going to impact, impact our output, our behavior, and our results. Like I shared with you, this is all fairly new, but what's important is this impacts the direction of our efforts, like where are we headed. This impacts how intense we are about our efforts as an organization and about uh, how we're going to deliver value to our customers. It impacts our persistence, like are we going to make sure that we do what it takes to survive and advance as long as it's ethical. Um, and all those factors go into how long and how well the organization survives. And then we have these other notions that feed into it, and that's ability. And ability means, are we bringing in the right people that can help advance the aims of the organization? So we got selecting the right people, we got training them, because no matter how well you select them, generally speaking, there are gonna be some skill ga gaps, or at the very least, some culture gaps. And then we gotta make sure that jobs are designed the right way because how we design the job, it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna impact how much and how well employees are engaged in their work. Uh, and so here, this slide is breaking out role perceptions even more. So when you have a clear idea about your role perception, you understand, you know, how my task contributes to the end, to the end or to the goals. You understand the priority of your task, you know, and not all tasks are value added tasks. And you also come to understand, you know, what are the expected behaviors of me as a team member, as a member of the organization, uh, in order for me to uh, achieve this notion of fit and to work well 
or at least in a constructive way in which the task that I am charged with performing get done, right? That's very important. And when you do it the right way, you have proficient job performance, which is, of course, important. Uh, you get to coordinate efforts better within teams. And then people just come in more motivated, right? That is very important. But the situational factors are things like what's going on within the environment? Like what are, what are our constraints? Meaning like what resources do we have or don't have? Because uh, if we have them that facilitate efforts, so if we don't have them that constrain efforts, then cues like what indicators do we have? Like how are we addressing uh, these emergent new competitor? How are we addressing safety and other elements in the external environment that can affect the things that we do? So I already told you about organizational citizenship behavior, as you can see, it says it again. Uh, but in a nutshell, organizational citizenship behavior is those discretionary activities. Like, for example, I am a professor, right? And I deliver instruction to students. I serve on committee task force. Uh, but there are some things that I do that are outside of my role, but still increase my engagement. I'm the director of the Center of Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And because I'm the director of the Center of Innovation and Entrepreneurship, I can go out and do all these innovative things and learn more about the needs of employers and learn more about well, what's needed in terms of business for the entrepreneurs. And I come back and I bring that back to the workplace and that engages me even more. So these discretionary activities motivate me where I say, you know what? I go out in the community and talk about Southwest Minnesota State University. I go out in the community and address community causes that are important to me. I would go out in the community and help recruit other students because the organization is recognizing and acknowledging my discretionary efforts that are not really mandated or captured in a job uh, description per se, but they are important to what I do and how I feel about the organization. So putting this on you, you, you are going to feel that way as well, what you already do, but you also are going to be responsible for supporting and facilitating others when they feel that way. They have these different things they want to do within their job or at least within the context of the organization that in turn can bring value to the organization. <clears throat> but sometimes we got to be careful about, you know, what you ask for because some behaviors can be counterproductive some behaviors can make the organization less efficient and it can actually demoralize the organization or the individual. And when you have this negative impact on individuals and groups, then you, what you have is absenteeism or what you have is turnover. People start calling in for work. It's like, it's like you as a student. When you're not feeling a professor or when you're not feeling like being in class, what do you do? I ah, mean, I'm sick. I, hey, professor, so and so, I would not be in class today. So you get, you know, one or two times you could, you know, you're thinking to yourself, okay, yeah, that's that. okay, well, I get that. But at the end of the day, when people are unhappy with the situation and the environmental context, then the reason why, because it's going against their internal values or going against how they feel about it. And your behaviors may be perceived as being counterproductive or you're not setting a culture that's welcoming and people would respond to that. They were responding in a big way. So as you can see, I talk from that just straight from the heart. I hope that kind of puts a face on some of the content that you're experiencing. I hope that you continue to enjoy the class. I will continue to do this for you visual learners uh, more and more. As you can see, I know my stuff. I've been talking about this stuff literally in my sleep, night, night. Um, but I would have step for do it, night, night. But, you know, it's always fun to talk to you. I hope to see you in the hallways. And I want to make one announcement real quick. Uh, on November 14th and November 16th, Southwest Minnesota State University is recognizing Global Entrepreneurship Week. And even if you're not an entrepreneur, there's a space for you. So on Tuesday at nine o'clock, we have student entrepreneurs that are going to compete for money. And when I'm talking about money, like first place is $1,000, second place is $500, and third place is $250. The students are going to compete with other student entrepreneurs 
at the high school level as well as the college level. Uh, then in the afternoon, there's a student association and Atis is going to do his thing and teach about professional development, uh, managing projects, and creating sustainable entities. Then on Thursday, we have this young lady, her name is Shartira Smith, and Shartira is going to share uh, what it takes to be successful entrepreneur or entrepreneur. Most of you are probably going to be entrepreneurs. That means being entrepreneur within the organization as employees, right? Um, and then we have a keynote speaker, Tim Swenson. Tim Swenson is going to tell us about action manufacturing. Action manufacturing makes action track chair. Action track chair produces products uh, for the physical disabled uh, that uh, in the form of RVs and ATVs and things like that. So that's a big deal. And then in the afternoon, there is going to be a panel discussion with established entrepreneurs and business leaders. And then there's going to be a cap off where all attendees, no matter where you are, can interact with the business community and build relationships. So I hope to see you at that event. I hope you enjoyed knowing a little bit more about me. But most of all, I hope that I put a face and some experience to the context and the content of Chapter 1. We'll do this again. Uh, until then, enjoy the rest of your holiday weekend, and I'll talk again soon. Uh, let's see, can I have a nice, smooth transition off, and take care.